to the February 9th edition of the Global Dialogue, our World Affairs Council Speakers Program. I'm Patrick Ryan, and uh, this is uh, Global Dialogue, and our special guest today will be, uh, is uh, Representative uh, Bayan Sami Abdul Rahman, who is the Kurdistan Regional Government Representative uh, to the United States. And we have a, a terrific program uh, for this evening. Um, Welcome, uh, Representative Bayan. Thank you very much, uh, Pat, for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to this evening. Same here. Let me uh, uh, open with some remarks here and then we'll get into our program. The KRG enjoys a special relationship with the United States. The Kurdish people of Iraq have been an important uh, partner seeking democracy and independence and looking to the West for partners. Tonight, we'll talk about that relationship, the history of Kurdistan, who the Kurdish people are across a number of country borders, the Kurdistan, the Kurdish region's situation within uh, Iraq, the fight against ISIS and the current situation there, the stability and security it enjoys in a rough neighborhood. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, Little Kurdistan, a community here in Nashville, Tennessee. Of course, uh, we will have your questions uh, for Representative Bayan. So please start adding those to the Q&A tab on your Zoom screen. Ayan Sami Abdul Rahman is the Kurdistan Regional Government KRG representative to the United States of America. Key to her role are strengthening ties between Kurdistan and the United States, advocating her government's position on a wide area, array of political security and humanitarian, economic and cultural matters and promoting coordination and partnership. Prior to her US appointment in 2015, Ms. Abdul Rahman was the high representative to the United Kingdom. She was elected to the Leadership Council of the Kurdistan Democratic Party, the KDP, in 2010. Before her career in public service, Ms. Abdul Rahman worked as a journalist for 17 years. She began her career on local newspapers in London and won the Observer Newspapers Farzad Bazaf Memorial Prize in 1993, which led to her work at the Observer and later at the Financial Times. She worked for the FT in Britain and in Japan, where she was Tokyo correspondent. Her late father, Sami Abdul Rahman, was a veteran of the Kurdish freedom movement, joining the Kurdish Democratic Party in 1963 and playing a critical leadership role in the Kurdish and Iraqi opposition to Saddam Hussein's regime. He held the post of Deputy Prime Minister of the Kurdistan Regional Government and General Secretary of the Kurdistan Democratic Party. Sami Abdul Rahman was killed alongside his elder son, Salah, and 96 others in a twin suicide bombing in 2004. Ms. Abdul Rahman was born in Baghdad. Her family briefly lived in Iran in the mid 1970s before moving to Britain in 1976. She is a history graduate from London University. Let me add that she's a great friend of the Tennessee World Affairs Council. We've been pleased to bring delegations of students to her office in Washington, where they were treated with great hospitality and received insightful briefings on Kurdistan and the Kurdish people. And she visited us here in Nashville for a program organized by the World Affairs Council and Lipscomb University in 2016. Representative Bayan, thank you again for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you so much uh, again, Pat, for inviting me and for that uh, uh, very kind introduction. Uh, in fact, uh, in March last year, I was due to do a lecture tour of Tennessee and part of that was to address the Tennessee World Affairs Council, but uh, it fell victim to COVID-19. It was one of the first uh, programs that unfortunately we had to cancel. So I'm very happy to be back with you today. I uh, want to just acknowledge uh, some friends who I believe might be in the audience. Uh, Jim Shepard, who is uh, chairman of the board of the Tennessee World Affairs Council, uh, Ambassador Charles Bauer, member of the board, and uh, many Kurdish friends uh, whose names I recognized from the list of RSVPs, including Nozad Haurami from the Salah Haddin Center in Nashville, uh, Dilman uh, Khan, who is, uh, I believe, from the Kurdish professionals. And uh, there are many other organizations, Kurdish American organizations, and uh, I welcome all of them who may have joined us today. Uh, so, Pat, I, I have a presentation. I don't know if you'd like me to go ahead or if you wanted to ask any questions before we launch into that. 
No, I just uh, want to, uh, along with you, acknowledge uh, our many friends from the Kurdish community here in Nashville and, and around the world who are joining us. Uh, we're, we're pleased that uh, when we have you uh, with us, we had attract a worldwide audience of uh, people interested in uh, Kurdish US relations and um, uh, ready to turn the floor over to you for a, a presentation that uh, will lead us into our program tonight. Thank you. Okay, so I have a PowerPoint presentation and then uh, I will of course be very happy to take questions. So uh, I just want to put my name on the screen for those of you who maybe find it difficult to say my name, it's very long, uh, but my first name is Bayan. Uh, if you think of it as Bay and An, uh, that'll get you there. So really what I want to discuss to tonight is uh, the United States and Kurdistan region in Iraq and the partnership that we have going back really th three decades. And in fact, uh, this year, 2021, is the 30th anniversary of Operation Provide Comfort, a military humanitarian operation in 1991 that saved many lives and really was a turning point in our recent history. So we have many reasons to celebrate our partnership, but particularly this year. So whenever we talk about Kurdistan, we have to do a little bit of background briefing and uh, maps always come into it. So if we go to the next slide, we have a map that uh, is not necessarily 100% accurate. It's hard to find accurate maps of uh, where the Kurdish people are in the Middle East. But I would say this map broadly gives you an idea uh, how the people of Kurdistan have been divided generally between four countries, Iraq, Iran, Turkey, and Syria. But uh, there are Kurds in Armenia, there are Kurds on the other side of Iran, uh, there are Kurds in Azerbaijan and other places. But usually when we talk about Kurdistan, we're talking about anything between 30 to 50 million people who live across these four countries. The reason why the population size is not accurate is uh, some Kurds are forced de to deny uh, their nationality or, or their ethnicity in those countries. Uh, some Kurds don't live any longer in those areas. For example, we believe that in Istanbul, there are one or two million Kurds living in Istanbul in Turkey. But uh, the, the number of Kurds really uh, varies wildly depending on whether you believe a Kurdish nationalist who would say 50 million and somebody who's anti-Kurdish who would say 20 million. Uh, personally, I think 40 million is probably about right. So this is where the Kurds are in the Middle East, and many of us have relatives uh, and connections across all four borders. But in terms of my position and the conversation we're having tonight, uh, I'm focusing on Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, which is in the next slide. Um, so this is Iraq, and uh, again, the, there are different colors in this map. Uh, again, this map is not necessarily 100% correct, but it gives you a general idea. Um, the green areas generally are what is called Kurdistan region. And this region has a status in the Iraqi constitution, and uh, we have our own regional parliament our regional president and prime minister. We have our own military force, the Peshmerga forces, who are part of Iraq's defense system, but uh, perhaps they would be akin to the National Guard of the United States. Uh, the state of Tennessee has its own National Guard. The Kurdistan region has the Peshmerga forces. So the green area is uh, roughly what would be called officially the Kurdistan region. But there are other parts of Iraq that we consider to be part of Kurdistan, but they have been dis designated uh, disputed territories in the Iraqi constitution. Um, and these areas are very important to us. We believe that culturally, linguistically, historically, they have been Kurdish. There has been forced demographic change in those areas over the years, but we believe that uh, they are part of Kurdistan 
and there is a mechanism in the Iraqi constitution for the people of the disputed territories to be able to uh, voice in a referendum whether they want to be part of Kurdistan region or not. Unfortunately, that mechanism has never been implemented. Um, so when I talk about Kurdistan this evening, I'm talking only about Iraqi Kurdistan because in my official capacity, I am the representative of the Kurdistan regional government of uh, Iraq. So uh, in the next slide, we will just see some basic information about Kurdistan region in Iraq. So our population in the region is about 5 million. If you include the disputed territories and Kurds in other parts of Iraq, it's perhaps six and a half, uh, perhaps 7 million. But in the Kurdistan region itself, we, we are about 5 million. Kurdistan is peaceful, it's stable, and because of that, it has been a safe haven for ethnic and religious minorities who have fled persecution and conflict in other parts of Iraq over the past decades. And more, most recently, a safe haven for those who fled ISIS uh, after 2014. Uh, even today, we are hosting one million refugees uh, and displaced people. So that includes refugees who fled the conflict in Syria, as well as internally displaced people who fled the conflict inside Iraq. Uh, peaceful coexistence is a key feature of Kurdistan. People of different ethnicities and faiths largely live in harmony. And uh, I would say the peaceful coexistence also stretches to our international friends. Americans are warmly welcomed in the Kurdistan region. And uh, in all of the time that there were vast numbers of American troops in Iraq and they were being killed, not a single American soldier was killed or injured in the Kurdistan region. And so because of that, I'm very proud to say that Kurdistan welcomes Americans and there are many American business people um, and others who even today are in the Kurdistan region and live in peace and harmony. So in the next couple of sl slides, you'll see some of the uh, uh, temples and churches um, belonging to, in this case, the Yazidis. Uh, so the Yazidis are an ethno-religious minority in Iraq. The Yazidi faith goes back thousands of years. Their prayers are in Kurdish and we see them as a, an integral part of Kurdistan region and uh, Iraq. And we are very saddened that uh, ISIS committed genocide against the, pe the Yazidi people and many have fled uh, to other countries, including the United States and Canada and Europe. Uh, but today, hundreds of thousands of them are still displaced in the Kurdistan region um, as uh, displaced communities. And then we also have Christians in Iraq and Kurdistan. Um, they would describe themselves as Assyrian. Some of them would say they're Chaldean or Syriac. Um, they, Assyr the Assyrians, of course, go back thousands of years and the Assyrian empire is uh, very famous and well known. But again, we're very proud that in Kurdistan, whether you are Turkmen, Assyrian, Kurd or Arab, whether by faith you are Christian, Yazidi, Muslim, or other uh, faiths like Kakais and so on. By and large, we're very proud that we live in peace and harmony and Kurdistan continues to be a safe haven for all who are fleeing conflict. So before I, I talk about Operation Provide Comfort and, and the partnership between Kurdistan and America, I really need to set the scene and describe the conflict and the genocide and the terrible dark times that the people of Kurdistan endured really over the decades uh, from the 15th onwards, but 60s, 70s, and most critically in the 1980s. So if we go to the next slide, um, the 1980s were particularly brutal uh, to the people of Kurdistan. This was the time when Saddam Hussein was in power and his Ba'athist party was really not that far different from communist Russia, uh, Soviet Union under Stalin 
or Nazi Germany under Hitler. Uh, he had a specific campaign of genocide against the Kurds that he called Anfal. Uh, he used chemical weapons over 200 times against the Kurds, uh, sometimes just against a small village or hamlet. Other times in Halabja, which was a city of 70,000 people. And uh, in, in that operation, 5,000 civilians, men, women, and children were killed through poison gas. And 10,000 at least were injured. There was also a, a demographic change in the disputed territories, which I mentioned earlier. This was called Arabization, a term used by Saddam himself, where Kurds were forced out of their homes and Arab settlers were brought in to take over their homes, their farms and their businesses. So the decades of genocide, which at the time, to be honest, I don't think we understood the term genocide, but looking back, this is what we were enduring, uh, really reached a peak in the late 70s and into the late 80s. In that time, 5,000 villages in Kurdistan were utterly destroyed and uh, hundreds of thousands of people were killed, disappeared. Um, the main victims were Kurds, but of course, if you, if you were Kurdish, if you were Christian, if you were Faili, which is uh, another religious minority, um, it, it didn't matter. If you didn't uh, support Saddam Hussein, then you were brutalized in this way. And of course, Arabs too, uh, particularly the Shia Arabs in the South, suffered at the hands of um, Saddam Hussein as well. So I think it's important that you understand and, and get this history of Kurdistan and Iraq uh, to then understand why it was so important for us that the United States and other countries intervened in 1990 and 91. So in 1990, Saddam Hussein made the mistake of invading Kuwait. And uh, this brought the wrath of the United States, which built a large coalition uh, of European and other countries to fight Saddam Hussein to liberate Kuwait. Uh, by the spring of 1991, uh, Kuwait had been liberated and uh, Saddam's forces were on the run. Eventually, he turned his attention to the Iraqi people against the Shia in the south who had had an uprising and the Kurds in Kurdistan region in the north who also rose up against Saddam Hussein because we believed that his regime was coming to an end. So this was in the spring of 1991. Saddam turned his forces against us and also against the Shia in the south. Now, don't forget, this is the spring of 91, only three years after Halabja, where 5,000 people had been killed through chemical weapons. And so hundreds of thousands, perhaps one and a half million, maybe more, Kurds fled Iraqi Kurdistan to the border mountains of Turkey and Iran. People were freezing to death. They were dying of exposure of starvation, the elderly and young children particularly were not able to climb these mountains with literally nothing but the clothes on their backs. Many were barefoot. I mean, the images of that uh, uh, exodus are just incredible. It's like a biblical scene of thousands of thousands of people on the mountainside in the snow and the mud uh, trying to flee because everybody thought that Saddam would use his chemical weapons again and that the international community would do nothing because they had done nothing in the 1980s. But fortunately, in the spring of 1991, um, the uh, United States, Britain, France, and uh, other countries, but really that core three countries, put together what, they, what was called Operation Provide Comfort. This was the largest military humanitarian operation of its kind at that time, perhaps still today the largest, I, I don't know, but they saved lives. They brought uh, hundreds of thousands, as I said, perhaps one and a half or two million people down from those border mountains back into Iraqi Kurdistan and back into their homes. They saved lives. 
And that's why this year we're very proud of this operation and we want to commemorate it uh, throughout 2021 as the 30th anniversary. So Operation Provide Comfort is important for us because of the people that it saved, but also it led to the um, creation of a no-fly zone over Kurdistan. And that no-fly zone uh, survived uh, throughout the 1990s all the way to 2003. And the no-fly zone provided protection to Kurdistan from Saddam Hussein. During that period, we were able to start to rebuild those 5,000 villages that were destroyed, uh, rebuild schools, uh, have some form of uh, self-government. But of course, Kurdistan region was poverty stricken. After all of the destruction that I described, uh, it, it was utterly destroyed. And uh, I uh, had been living in the United Kingdom as a refugee. And in 1992, uh, I was able to go back to Kurdistan for the first time. And I visited Halabja and other places. And I saw with my own eyes the utter destruction that I had really only seen before in photographs of post-World War II Europe, where you would see cities uh, just in rubble. So the 1990s, uh, we had the no-fly zone protecting us, uh, some form of rebuilding and reconstruction, but Kurdistan was poverty stricken. To make matters worse, unfortunately, we fell into a civil war between roughly uh, 94 to 98, uh, perhaps a little bit later than that. Um, this is really a very dark period in our history and, and many of us uh, have deep regrets that that uh, civil war took place in the first place. Um, but then in uh, mid 1990s, the UN instigated the UN oil for food program. So this was a program where Iraq's oil would be sold and the revenues would uh, be used by the United Nations to provide humanitarian assistance, food and medicine to the people of Iraq. Unfortunately, the UN Oil for Food program was corrupt. The UN only deals with the sovereign state. And in this case, the sovereign state is a dictator who has committed genocide. Nevertheless, the UN insists on, on operating along those lines. So the program was very corrupt, but some of the revenues uh, through the UN did make their way to Kurdistan region. And this really provided some relief uh, to the people of Kurdistan and, and uh, the, the little amounts of money that were coming to the Kurdistan region were used uh, to continue the building, continue the reconstruction and, and to really stabilize the Kurdistan region. And so by the late 1990s, there was a ceasefire. The, the civil war was coming to an end. The oil for food program was providing some financial and humanitarian assistance. And so Kurdistan was really beginning to uh, stabilize. Then 9-11 happened uh, and we all knew that uh, things around the world were changing. And uh, by 2002, 2003, it became very clear that the United States was going to intervene in Iraq. And uh, at the beginning, we were very concerned about this because we didn't know what that would mean for the Kurdistan region. But in fact, the liberation of Iraq uh, began a, a golden decade for us in Kurdistan. Um, and please do remember what I had said about how much our people and our region had suffered under the dictatorship. So now here we are for the first time, uh, we are able to enjoy an Iraq, a new Iraq, where Saddam and the dictatorship has been removed. This is an opportunity for Iraq to have federalism, to have democracy, to have freedom of speech, uh, to have equality between Kurds and Arabs, between people of different faiths and cultures. And during that decade or so after the liberation, really Kurdistan region flourished. We opened two international airports, and even today, uh, you can fly uh, direct into Erbil or Soleimani Airport. Unfortunately, no direct flights from Washington or Tennessee, 
but uh, you can fly to Vienna, for example, and uh, get an Austrian Airlines flight direct. You can fly to Istanbul and go on Turkish Airlines, Royal Jordanian. Uh, there are many airlines. Um, I think there are flights from about 30 or so cities to Kurdistan region. Of course, I'm not talking about COVID restrictions. So anybody thinking about flying, you have to bear in mind COVID. I'm talking about pre-COVID. Um, so these international airports have made a very big difference uh, to us. Before that, we had to fly into Syria or Turkey and then take a very long drive and uh, cross uh, the border. But now we can fly direct from Europe into the heart of Kurdistan. Uh, we have private, private and public schools and universities. There are two American universities or universities based on the American system. And I know that they have affiliations and partnerships with several American universities in the United States. Uh, English is now a second language in schools. We've built hospitals, roads, infrastructure. And uh, we really started to work on Kurdistan as a tourist destination. Um, it is a tourist destination within Iraq and within our neighborhood. People from Iran, uh, Jordan, Iraq, Turkey, other parts of Iraq definitely think of Kurdistan as a tourist destination because it's peaceful and stable, number one. It has a much cooler climate than southern Iraq, for example. We have mountains, we have rivers, we have many historic sites, and uh, we uh, believe that uh, tourism uh, can be one of the pillars of our uh, economy. And in, in the period immediately after the liberation, we were also able to start an oil and gas industry from scratch. We always knew that Kurdistan was rich in oil and gas, but uh, Iraqi governments deliberately didn't uh, really promote that because they didn't want the Kurds to have access to it. But from 2007 or so, we have been able to sign contracts with um, international oil companies, many of which are American. And we're very proud that together with American private sector, the American companies and their know-how, uh, we have been able to build an oil industry from scratch. And in a very short period of time, Kurdistan has been able to produce the same amount of oil as Libya, which has had a much longer history of oil production than we have. So we have been enjoying this uh, decade of uh, an economic boom, a flourishing of our society and opening up of Kurdistan to the world. Unfortunately, in the meantime, the politics in Iraq was going in the wrong direction. Um, increasingly, there were sectarian uh, leaders in Baghdad, sectarian governments who uh, marginalized the Sunni Arab community, uh, tried to marginalize uh, the Kurds as well in terms of governance, share of the budget, uh, in terms of uh, democracy and uh, civil rights. So increasingly, we were seeing that kind of governance in Baghdad. Uh, to the point where some of the Sunni Arab community started to support an organization called ISIS, the Islamic State in uh, Iraq and Syria, uh, or ISIL, also known as Daesh. ISIS uh, really came on the international scene in 2014, when people started to realize that ISIS had overrun huge swathes of territory in Syria and in Iraq. In Iraq, they took about one third of Iraq's territory. So imagine that. So overnight in the middle of 2014, Kurdistan region found itself bordering a terrorist state as they called themselves the Islamic State. Of course, we, 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 we are Muslims as well, but we don't believe in the form of extreme um, extremism that they believe in. So in 2014, ISIS rampaged across Iraq and Syria, committed genocide against the Yazidis, the Christians, against the Kurds as well, Turkmen and, and others in Iraq and Syria. Um, at the beginning when 
ISIS was attacking different groups in Syria and in Iraq, it was very uncertain whether anybody would come to our aid. Um, in August 2014, President Obama decided to order airstrikes. And these airstrikes were to protect Erbil, our capital, the capital of Kurdistan region, and also to protect the Yazidis in Sinjar. Uh, of course, by then, ISIS had already killed many in Sinjar. So these airstrikes really changed everything. It meant that we had support, and particularly the support of the United States. And uh, please don't forget what I had said about 1991, when there was another time where our people were under attack and the United States came to our aid. So what uh, happened in 2014 when President Obama ordered the airstrikes changed everything. Our Peshmerga forces were ill-equipped to fight ISIS. ISIS had captured uh, heavy, sophisticated American weaponry when it rampaged through Mosul. Uh, our Peshmerga had been deprived of any weaponry except for the very basic Kalashnikovs and perhaps RPGs. So they were completely outgunned by ISIS. But once the airstrikes happened, we knew that we had the United States uh, on our back with, our, with us, uh, supporting us, taking us as their partners. This changed and the Peshmerga continued the fight until eventually weapons and ammunition were delivered to enable them to fight ISIS on a more equal footing. But the period between 2014 and 16 was a very, very difficult one for us in the Kurdistan region. I can really say these difficulties extended beyond 2016, but this was the peak of the crisis for us. So we found ourselves at war with a very sophisticated, uh, incredibly well-equipped, the most well-equipped terrorist organization in the world. And uh, we're fighting to defend a 650 mile front line. Two, 2,000 Peshmerga, our military were killed in this and over 10,000 were wounded. So this was a very costly war for us. It also led, a, led to a humanitarian crisis. Uh, nearly 2 million displaced people uh, fled to the Kurdistan region for shelter. So these are the Yazidis and Christians and Arabs who fled ISIS uh, in Iraq to come to the Kurdistan region. We also had Syrians who were fleeing the Syrian com conflict come into the Kurdistan region. Many of those uh, displaced people have returned to their homes, but still there are about 1 million uh, displaced and refugee communities in the Kurdistan region today. They continue to stay with us. While all of this was going on, while we're shel sheltering nearly 2 million refugees, while we're fighting ISIS, uh, the Iraqi budget had cut off our budget in early 2014, and it was withheld throughout this period. And at the same time, there was a crash in oil prices. So this was really a, an incredibly difficult time for the people of Kurdistan. And I'm very, very proud of how our people endured uh, without money, uh, sharing everything that we had with the refugees and IDPs who had come to join us and share with us uh, the safe haven that we have. And uh, here I would really like to thank the United States for supporting us in the fight against ISIS and that support continues today, that partnership continues today, but also to thank America for being the largest humanitarian aid contributor to Iraq. Uh, none of that aid comes to the Kurdistan regional government. It goes to the UN, to the WHO or the World Food Programme or NGOs that support those displaced communities. So this was a very difficult time uh, and I described very briefly earlier how uh, during the decade or so after the liberation of Iraq, while we had begun in a very optimistic mood that Iraq was being liberated, it was our chance as Iraqis to have democracy and federalism and uh, equal citizenship for all of us. 
over time, the leadership in Baghdad became more and more sectarian. And then we had ISIS. And even while we're fighting ISIS, Baghdad is uh, at times not allowing weapons to reach our Peshmerga that were being delivered by Germany, France, the United States. Uh, Baghdad was uh, de delaying the delivery of, of those weapons or completely withholding our budget. Uh, there were many other reasons as well, which I can go into in the q and I, I don't want to prolong this uh, presentation, uh, but there were many, many reasons uh, that led us in 2017 to have an independence referendum. This referendum uh, was really asking a very straightforward question to our people in Iraq, the Kurdish or the people of Kurdistan in Iraq. Would you like the Kurdistan region or Kurdistan in Iraq to be an independent state? And the answer was yes or no. There was a high turnout, uh, about 72% turnout, and 93% of those who voted, voted yes to independence. And uh, there was actually uh, a rally in Nashville in uh, the August of 2017 where the Kurdish American community in Nashville held a rally in support of the referendum. So there were many reasons that led us to this referendum. I can go into the details. Unfortunately, the reaction of Iraq, of the United States, of uh, our neighbors was very, very hostile. Um, I think the next slide actually shows the rally uh, in Nashville. Uh, I believe this was outside the federal courthouse. If, I, if I'm not wrong, you might be able to recognize it, Patrick. <laughs> so um, we had the that, referendum. Uh, that looks like uh, city, city Square in front of um, the uh, city of Nashville main office and uh, the courthouse area. Right. Well, I was there too. Uh, and it was a oh, very great. proud, it was a very proud, but very hot day. It was in August. <laughs> so after the referendum, uh, the United States had tried to persuade us to postpone the referendum. Uh, but we felt uh, that what the US was offering was not enough. It was a postponement for no guarantee that if we held the referendum in the future, that the United States would at that stage support it or respect the result. So uh, from our perspective, it was a postponement with not enough um, in, the, in the promise of the future. Um, unfortunately, the US position was so hostile, so vis vociferous, and in my opinion, and, and I'm sorry to say this about our, our friends in America, it was a very unsophisticated campaign to push us to, to uh, stop the referendum or to, to delay it. And it was very, very disappointing. And, and I would say in, in the six years that I've been here in Washington, this was probably the most difficult time in our relationship with the United States. There were some tense discussions, but also some very friendly uh, discussions as well. Uh, but I don't think you can be friends and partners uh, for decades without having disagreements along the way. And this was certainly one of those disagreements. But after the referendum, uh, the government in Baghdad uh, tried to isolate Kurdistan diplomatically. They banned flights to and from Kurdistan. They tried to put us in, under an economic blockade and there were military attacks as well. Uh, from some militias and, and some uh, Iraqi forces. Fortunately, we have many friends in Europe and even in our neighborhood, believe it or not, and of course in the United States, who did not want to see the people of Kurdistan punished for frankly just exercising our democratic rights and certainly did not agree with the extent to which Baghdad wanted to punish us. And here we have to recognize uh, President Macron of France, who opened the diplomatic uh, avenue for our pr prime minister at the time to visit Paris, despite Baghdad object objecting to it, uh, and to uh, lend his support to the Kurdistan region. 
And around that time, we also had a statement from H.R. McMaster, who, at this, the, if you remember, was the national security advisor to President Trump, who also said that while the United States had disagreed with the referendum, the United States was committed to a viable, economically strong Kurdistan region and stable Kurdistan region within an independent sovereign Iraq. So I think this was a very good pushback on the negative elements in, in Baghdad and elsewhere. Who thought that uh, uh, with the, the fallout of the referendum, they, they could uh, go back to the 80s and the 70s and uh, hurt the Kurds without the international community taking notice. Those days are gone. We have a voice. We have a Kurdish diaspora uh, all over the world, uh, perhaps numbering two or three million. If, if, you, if you count uh, around the Middle East, the number will be much more than that. But certainly in Europe, North America, Australia, uh, there are one or two million Kurds who uh, have uh, a very loud voice, including the Kurdish Americans in Tennessee. So um, we were able to stabilize the situation really from around 2018. By 19, our relationship with Baghdad was beginning to normalize. So I want to take us to 2020 and, and kind of where we are today. 2018 and 19, as I said, our relationship with Baghdad stabilized. There was a new government in Baghdad. Uh, 2018, there were elections. So our relationship with Baghdad had stabilized. And again, we're, we're very grateful to the international supporters that we had who ensured that that would happen. But like the rest of the world, 2020 uh, knocked us uh, sideways. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, has had a huge impact on the health of the people of Kurdistan and Iraq, and of course on the economy. Uh, the figures I have, I, I looked them up uh, uh, last night, uh, so they may have changed today, but these were the figures as of yesterday. Um, and you can see that uh, according to the World Bank and the World Food Programme, they believe that Iraq's uh, population is at risk of falling into poverty at a much higher rate than previously. And there is a, a lack of food security for a growing population uh, in Iraq. In the Kurdistan region today, uh, the economy is suffering enormously because we are reliant on oil. The oil price has increased actually in the past few weeks. Um, uh, it had fallen dramatically last year. Uh, we also have issues with Baghdad over our budget, our share of the budget, but uh, I can go into that later on if, if you like in the Q&A. Uh, but really, I would say that the pandemic has impacted us like the rest of the world. Now, going on to the next slide, I just want to speak a little bit about the Kurdistan regional government, our current cabinet led by uh, Prime Minister Masroor Barzani. So this cabinet was sworn in in July, 2019. Um, and immediately our prime minister said that his priority was to have a strong relationship between Erbil and Baghdad or the KRG and the government in Baghdad, the federal government. And we have strived to have uh, a good and solid relationship uh, with our partners in Baghdad. And the priorities, the other priorities for the government are freedom, democracy, and peaceful coexistence to develop the private sector. And we are looking to our partners in the United States for that. An increasing number of American companies are investing in Kurdistan. And we're very grateful to the US Chamber of Commerce uh, and to the US Kurdistan Business Council for working with us um, to promote those economic ties. We also uh, see Kurdistan as an important player in the region, in terms of the region's stability. Uh, by the region, I mean the Middle East. And also we are partners to the coalition that continues to fight ISIS and particularly the United States. So this is the program of, of our government. Of course, uh, some of the program is 
under stress because of the weakening economy, but this is uh, certainly something that we are very much committed to. So I want to talk a little bit more about our partnership with the United States. So in, the, in this slide, you will see our leadership. Uh, we have good ties with Republicans, with Democrats, with uh, various uh, administrations. Um, George W. Bush uh, met many of our leaders, uh, President Obama, President Bush, excuse me, President Obama, President Trump uh, met with uh, Nechi Van Barzani, uh, who is the president of our region. And the other photograph shows our prime minister meeting President Joe Biden, I believe when he was vice president, uh, just looking at the picture, I think it's from the Obama years. Um, but really what I'm trying to underscore here is that uh, we have um, a good relationship with the United States. Here in Washington, our office has um, very good access to members of Congress of uh, both parties, and of course, including Jim Cooper, Congressman Cooper of Nashville, who is co-chair of the Kurdish American Congressional Caucus and uh, a very good friend to uh, us in Washington and I know to the community in Nashville. And, and here I, I would like once again to express my condolences to Congressman Cooper and his family on, on the passing of uh, his wife recently. Um, the way we see our partnership with the United States is that we are partners in the fight against ISIS. ISIS, of course, has been defeated as a caliphate, but it continues as a terrorist organization. And we need to be, uh, we need to continue to be vigilant against ISIS. Um, we are trying to grow our cultural ties and economic ties with the United States. And uh, I believe the uh, Kurdish American diaspora here in the United States can play an important role in that. And uh, of course, I, I want to touch a, a little bit on the community in Nashville, uh, which you will see in this slide. So I believe uh, there are about 15,000 uh, Kurdish Americans in Nashville. Uh, if somebody has a more accurate figure than that, please let me know. But I think this is the generally accepted number. And this makes uh, the community in Nashville the largest single congregation of Kurds in North America. And we're very proud that uh, Nashville is sometimes referred to as Little Kurdistan. Most of the Kurds in Nashville arrived as refugees fleeing Saddam Hussein and the dictatorship in the 1970s. But today, um, they are Kurdish Americans, they are law-abiding citizens, many of them, uh, 60 or 70 of them running uh, 60 or 70 businesses in, in the Nashville area, several community centers, the TKCC, Tennessee Kurdish uh, Community Center, the Salah Eddin Center, Kurdish Professionals, Effendi Foundation. Uh, these are all uh, Kurdish American organizations in Nashville. And what we're seeing is the second generation of uh, Kurdish Americans uh, really going into professions uh, across America, like medicine, engineering, law, accountancy, and many of them continuing to open uh, family businesses. Uh, Kurdistan region, I've, I've talked so much about the economy and security issues. I, I want to touch a little bit about our culture, touch on uh, our culture. So I've tried to summarize, but there's so much to say about culture. Uh, the, the beautiful young woman in the picture, um, she is a, a singer. Her name is Chopi. She also has a design house, a fashion house, if you like. Uh, she is a very, very talented and popular singer, but music plays a very important part in, in our society and our culture. Uh, Erbil Football Club or Soccer Club, excuse me, is uh, one of the best clubs in Iraq and uh, I think twice in the last decade it has reached the finals of the Asia Soccer uh, Cup. Uh, so we're very proud that Erbil uh, Soccer Club has done so well. And that painting that was on the screen 
is uh, a painting by Rostam Aghala, who is a very, very well-known Kurdish painter and artist. And actually there are many Kurdish painters whose works are now very sought after in America and uh, Europe. Now, you can't talk about our culture and heritage without talking about Erbil, our capital, which is the longest continuously inhabited city in the world. Uh, it goes back, uh, I believe, to 6000 BC. And um, the, the, what looks like a castle, that is the Erbil Citadel. Um, and I wanted to show you that we have that history, but we also have very modern parts to Erbil and, and Kurdistan. And uh, I believe, Pat, uh, we have a video that we can show yes, right yes, now. Yes, we do. We're, we're ready to, to play the video. So this video is focusing on Erbil. Bayan, we have uh, a few more slides, but uh, in the interest of time, maybe I can uh, run through some of those as we answer some questions. We have a very interested uh, audience, but first let me thank you for that wonderful presentation. Uh, I think in addition to being uh, a journalist and a, a diplomat, you have a, a career ahead in academia, teaching people uh, in, in, in beautiful uh, descriptions and, and uh, presentations about the uh, uh, Kurdistan and the Kurdish people. That was uh, an exhaustive uh, examination and, and very little uh, amount of time. And I think everyone learned a great deal about Kurdistan, uh, the history, the relationship with the United States and uh, why it's important for us to uh, understand the, the nature of that relationship. Um, if we uh, could turn to some questions, let me start out with one that I had and it's echoed by Angela Weck, who uh, is with us. She's the executive director of the Peoria Area World Affairs Council. Uh, so you have World Affairs Council people from around the country tuning in as well. And Angela and I uh, have a, a question about the relationship with the Biden administration. And we talked separately about the, some of the relationships between uh, Kurds, uh, the, uh, officials and others and uh, the State Department and uh, uh, President Biden himself who has been to Kurdistan quite a number of times. But Angela adds uh, to that uh, notion, what are the top priorities uh, for you with the uh, Biden administration to pursue? Uh, well, thank you. That's a very good and very important question for us right now. Um, well, as you said, we're fortunate that President Biden knows Kurdistan and Iraq very well. When he was a senator, he addressed the Kurdistan parliament uh, about probably 20 years ago now. Uh, also, Secretary of State Blinken, Secretary of Defense Austin, they uh, also know uh, our issues very, very well. So these um, appointments and, and so on give us confidence in the new administration. Of course, it doesn't mean that they're going to do 
everything that we would like. It just means that they're familiar with the issues, they understand, and uh, that is a position of strength, I think. We had a very good relationship with the uh, Obama administration, with the Trump administration as well, and I expect it will be the same with the Biden administration. Um, we need each other. Of course, we need the United States uh, to uh, help us continue to fight ISIS. Uh, it remains a threat in Iraq and Syria. Um, of course, it's not in, in Kurdistan. Kurdistan is safe from that, but there are these areas, uh, I guess, in the disputed territories where there are pockets of ISIS. And so we need the coalition, which is led by the United States, to continue. We need the United States and they need us for that. But also, as I said, Kurdistan is a factor for peace and stability within Iraq and in the broader region. And I think uh, the United States needs reliable partners. The Middle East is a very tough neighborhood. Um, your enemy's enemy is my friend and my friend is your enemy and so on. <laughs> so uh, you, to have a loyal, reliable partner uh, is very important for both sides. So I think in that sense, we, we also support each other. In terms of our priorities, um, we would like the United States to keep uh, a troop presence in Iraq. Um, President Trump uh, reduced the number of troops to about 2,500. Uh, we would like that number to, to remain and, and if need be increased, but uh, if not, then at least maintain that uh, number because uh, the US and coalition presence is needed uh, in Iraq to maintain stability. But also what we would like to do, um, and we've been working on this for a few years now, is to broaden the relationship between the Kurdistan region and the United States so that secure, the security partnership is one very important element and an anchor to the partnership. But what about culture? What about sport? What about education? What about uh, business and trade relations? So um, this is another area that we want to expand our relationship with the United States. We have a, a couple of questions about the referendum. Um, Ambassador Bowers asks, why uh, have the Kurdish people never succeeded in having their own sovereign uh, and independent country? And I, I think you touched on that, but there's some other uh, takes on the uh, the issue. Uh, Kevin uh, Bamani asked, uh, uh, how did the Iraqi Kurdistan's referendum affect other Kurds in Syria, Turkey, and Iran? And um, uh, Ugar Yavasi asks, why did KRG take such a risk despite the confrontation of a powerful state like America? So it, it's uh, generated okay. some interest in, in uh, how that all uh, came about and, and what uh, the regional reaction was and uh, the confrontation with the United States policy. Okay, so um, Ambassador Bauer's question, why, why the Kurds have not uh, managed to have a, a state uh, in the post-World War I settlement uh, and treaties that were being negotiated, um, there was uh, uh, one treaty that did uh, allow for or set out a Kurdish state that uh, would have been uh, created. But this treaty was overridden or superseded by another treaty later on. So that was an opportunity that uh, really um, was missed by us, but also at that time, it, the imperial powers were deciding things. Uh, frankly, I'm not sure that whatever we would have said and done, and there were Kurds who lobbied for a state at that time, it was the imperial powers who were making the decisions and carving up uh, the Ottoman Empire and creating states like uh, Turkey and Iraq and, and so on, Syria. So uh, that was uh, one uh, period when uh, the borders that we see today uh, were created and in what is called the Sykes-Picot Agreement. Um, then if you come to uh, 2017, I explained what drove us to hold a referendum. Uh, we had been very excited about 2003, that we thought this was a new Iraq, this would be a federal Iraq, 
this would be democratic, Kurds and Arabs would be brothers and equals. But what we saw was um, a, everybody going counter to the Iraq constitution, our budget being withheld, the weapons, as I said, that were being sent to the Peshmerga being delayed, um, and really, uh, despite all of us fighting together against ISIS, Baghdad still would not, uh, did not want to cooperate and recognize the role of the Kurdistan region. Um, so they, these were, and there were many other reasons, it, it would take a whole session to just talk about the referendum. Sure. Now, the United States uh, objected to the referendum. That didn't surprise us. Uh, the United States and European countries, their de facto position is to be against independence movements. Very rarely the United States has been in favor of an independence movement, and I think South Sudan is one of those rare occasions. Usually the United States, Britain, France, they're against refer um, independence movements. So we weren't surprised about that. What we were surprised about was how uh, the United States went about it. You had uh, very high level American officials saying the referendum is illegitimate, which it was not, uh, saying that we didn't have the right to hold it, saying publicly that the Kurds were on their own. Your neighbors will attack you and you're on your own. Why do you say that? You're giving carte blanche to uh, our hostile uh, neighbors, including those in Iraq, to think that the Kurds are on their own and uh, that we will be able to attack them. Uh, I think the- so this, the, this was the uh, first year of the Trump administration? That's right, we held, the, we held the referendum in September, 2017. Um, there was an, an offer, as I mentioned earlier, um, that uh, could we postpone the referendum for two years. In that two years, the United States and other partners in Europe would work uh, to bring Erbil and Baghdad closer together and to have a kind of a, a, a more uh, equitable settlement between the two sides. But uh, the draft of that letter did not make a strong enough pledge that if after two years, relations did not improve, the US would support a referendum. It did not say that the US would respect the result of the referendum. And frankly, that effort just came too late. And I would say that some of those who were involved in that effort would today recognize that that effort was just made far too late in the game. We also made mistakes. I'm not saying that all of the mistakes were on one side, but we made mistakes. And I would say that our international friends made mistakes too. And it was just too late. Um, and some people had already started voting. Those of us abroad uh, were voting electronically. The vote had already started by, the, by that time. Um, the other questions were, uh, how did this affect Kurds in other parts of Kurdistan? And why, why did we go ahead when the US was against it? I think I've explained why, why we went ahead. Yes. Um, Kurds in other parts of Kurdistan, um, I think it, it uh, captured their hearts. We are all linked by blood and belonging. Uh, those borders were not chosen by us. They were imposed on us over the centuries and then over the 20th century. Uh, many of us have family that cross one or two borders. Uh, in my case, we cross all of the borders actually. So when something happens in Syria, yes, those, my relatives in Syria are considered Syrian citizens, whatever, I, I don't care. I, I care about their well being. I care about their rights as Kurds to be able to speak their language, to name their children Kurdish names to uh, have cultural and political and other rights like everybody else. Um, so when something good or bad happens in any part of Kurdistan, we all feel the pain and we all feel the joy. Uh, so certainly it captured the imagination of, of Kurds elsewhere. Let me ask uh, one more question about uh, the Kurdish relationship with Kurds in other countries. Frank Rettenberg in San Rafael, uh, California, ask about the PKK 
and uh, their their activities in uh, Turkey. Uh, what's what's the official relationship or policy uh, from the KRG towards the PKK? Well, we recognize uh, that the Kurds in Turkey or wherever they are, Syria, Iran, Iraq, have rights. Hum human rights are universal. They have the right to speak their language. They have the right to have political representation and so on. And they have the right to live in peace. And so uh, we have advocated for a peaceful and long lasting sustainable settlement of the Kurdish question in Turkey. And in fact, around uh, 2013, 14, we were instrumental in uh, beginning a dialogue between Ankara and the Kurds in Turkey. Uh, we played a very positive role in that and there was a very hopeful optimistic moment but unfortunately the moment passed and the relationship between the Kurds, uh, some of the Kurds in Turkey and Ankara uh, unfortunately uh, got worse uh, after that time. Now the PKK uh, has come out of that situation. The PKK has been was created because Kurdish rights were denied. The Kurdish language was criminalized in Turkey at one time. So this is how the PKK has come about. Our relations today, we uh, do not recognize the PKK as a terrorist organization, for example, which is how Europe and America recognize the PKK. We certainly don't call them a terrorist organization, but we don't always uh, like their tactics. And uh, we believe that sometimes they put our civilians at risk. Um, there are PKK elements uh, in uh, mountain areas of Iraqi Kurdistan and in Sinjar. And unfortunately, we believe that they're playing a negative role. By being there, they attract Turkish bombardment um, to the border areas or to the Sinjar area, which is outside of the Kurdistan region, but uh, part of what we consider to be uh, a disputed territory. So um, we would ask our brothers, in the PKK, our sisters in the PKK, you have played uh, an important role in certain times, critical times, but right now you're playing a negative role by attracting instability to certain areas of uh, Iraq and uh, the borders of Kurdistan with Turkey. I would say that we have uh, time for two more questions, but we're over time, but let's uh, try a couple more with with your indulgence, we appreciate uh, your time this evening. Um, one question about the, the Kurdish-Israeli relationship. Is there anything you could comment on about the uh, connections there? Uh, well, there are no official relations. Um, in terms of uh, setting uh, official relations, Baghdad or the federal government has the authority to do that. Um, so technically, uh, technically, the state of Iraq and state of Israel are still at war. Uh, maybe the Abraham Accords <laughs> will one day extend uh, to Iraq. I, I think it'll be far off, uh, unfortunately. Um, but certainly in the Kurdistan region, we are not hostile to Israel. Uh, and uh, we also support the Palestinians and the Palestinians in fact have uh, a consular uh, representative in the Kurdistan region. Kurdistan region has about, I think, 36 diplomatic representations, um, including a, a US consulate, uh, British and, and so on. So there is a pa Palestinian representative, but not Israeli because Iraq does not have official relations with Israel. Sure. However, there are about, I believe, 200,000 or so Kurdish Jews in Israel. Um, the Jews in Iraq were forced out of the country uh, in the 40s and 50s. Uh, many of them still have relations and uh, connections uh, at a grassroots level with Kurdistan, but officially uh, there are no relations. I've got uh, a question about the UNITAD, the UN uh, body that's now uh, mm -hmm. looking at accountability for crimes committed by Daesh, uh, ISIS. Uh, any comments about that? I saw something in the news. Recently, the prime minister was talking with uh, Yazidis who were uh, brutalized by, uh, by ISIS. Uh, yes, absolutely. So we, we support uh, the work of UNITAD. 
Um, I just have to give a little bit of background, I will be brief. As I mentioned, ISIS committed genocide uh, against the Yazidis, the Christians, Kurds, Arabs, and others uh, in Syria and in Iraq. I would say the Yazidis were the biggest victims. They sexually enslaved um, thousands of Yazidi girls and women. They used uh, Yazidi men as slave labor. Many of those people have been rescued, but even today about 2,800 Yazidis are missing. And uh, our president, Kurdistan region's president has stated that we will continue to try and find every single Yazidi who is missing. Um, so when ISIS did this, we in the Kurdistan regional government immediately recognized what they did as genocide. I mentioned earlier in my presentation that when we were the victims of genocide in the 60s and 70s, we didn't know the word genocide. We didn't know that we should collect the evidence. Uh, and it was much more difficult in that period anyway. By the time, unfortunately, when ISIS was committing uh, these crimes, we did know you need to gather the evidence, you need to gather testimony, you need to lobby for an international court. And that's exactly what we did immediately in 2014. The Kurdistan regional government was the first to call this genocide, the first to go uh, to the UN, to the International Criminal Court, to Washington, to London, to The Hague, to say that this is genocide and there needs to be an investigation, an international investigation and an international tribunal. Unfortunately, there isn't really an appetite uh, for an international tribunal, but at least the United Nations managed to get the agreement of various nations, including Iraq, to establish UNITAD um, as a UN body that will investigate the crimes of ISIS. UNITAD began its work a couple of years ago. We in the Kurdistan region are cooperating. All of the evidence we have gathered, we have handed to them. Uh, most of the Yazidis who fled ISIS are still in the Kurdistan region. And so uh, we don't know what will happen to the evidence that UNITAD is collecting. Will there be an international tribunal one day, maybe a hybrid international Kurdish or Iraqi tribunal? But in my opinion and the opinion of many, without justice, you will never have reconciliation in Iraq. And so justice has to, to be the first part of that process. Well, um, this, is, this has been a fascinating uh, time. Uh, thank you, Bayan. And let me ask uh, one last question about uh, uh, the relationship with Nashville and, and other American cities and states. We have a question, what are the ways and American states and cities can work with growing the relationship with Kurds both in America and outside? Well, um, we really want to expand our cultural ties. Uh, as I mentioned, we have um, two American universities in Kurdistan. Um, they are reaching out to universities in the United States for accreditation and affiliation and joint research programs. And I think that's one way Another is through uh, commercial ties. Uh, whenever I do travel around the United States, and I look forward to doing that again, wherever I go, I try to meet with uh, Kurds, Kurdish Americans in that city or that state. I try to meet with the Chamber of Commerce in that city or state. I try to meet with local officials, the mayor, the governor, and really try to promote uh, stronger commercial and cultural ties between Kurdistan region. And, uh, and in this case with Tennessee, we already have a very vibrant Kurdish American community. And I know they're very, very proud uh, to be in Nashville and in Tennessee. And we would love to deepen the commercial and cultural ties uh, with Nashville and with Tennessee State as well. Terrific. Well, as Halvin uh, uh, Arif from the Nashville community uh, of Kurds here, says in his comment, in, uh, in the comment here, uh, thank you for doing this event. And everyone here looks forward to a, a live person, live in-person event here in Nashville when conditions are back to normal. Uh, we've been talking with uh, Representative uh, Bayan Sami Abdul Rahman, the KRG, Kurdish uh, Regional Government Representative to the United States of America. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for the presentation. 
and uh, best wishes to you and your, your group in Washington and to all our Kurdish friends. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And to everybody, uh, please be back uh, with us tomorrow for our Global News Review at 1 p.m. Central Time. And thank you for your participation, your great questions, and consider becoming a member of the Tennessee World Affairs Council. Visit our website, tnwac.org, where you can uh, get more information. Thank you again, and everybody have a good evening.